And this evening, the discussion is going to be Tendai established in Japan. Today is the anniversary of Tendai's uh, establishment in Japan. Now, this particular talk is given at least once a year um, on the observance of Dengyo Daishi. And I have to admit that I, I took basically the same slideshow I used last year at this time, and I've repurposed it with some new pictures and a few new sections, but it is similar. Um, and part of the reason was that I thought that what I was doing last year was a service to many people, but many of the people that we have now weren't here at that time. So I thought that I could reuse it. And I just want to mention a few things at the outset that I often uh, mention in talks like this. And that is to say that um, religion, when we talk about Tendai, it's obviously religion. And religion in Europe, the Middle East, and the Americas is delineated by the Abrahamic traditions, which are exclusionary by definition and are a component of the social milieu. In Asia, what we refer to as religion are rituals, philosophies, and practices thoroughly integrated into the culture and are not exclusionary. And that makes a really big difference. And so when we discuss Tendai this evening, you'll see evidence of that. So this is a different lens through which we experience both universal and local, local divine phenomena compared to religion, in quotes, in the Eurocentric sense. So we will continue. And since it's winter time, I thought that a nice snowy scene woodblock print would be appropriate. And this evening is going to be a contextual exploration, and it's a rather long presentation compared to other evenings. So please bear with me. And what I'd like to start with this evening is what was Buddhism like in Japan before Saicho and the Tendai school? We're going to do a brief recitation of Saicho's contributions and a few points, a selective, uh, selective recitation of events surrounding the Tendai establishment and a few points about Tendai innovations in Japan. Now, the Tendai innovations are part of, an, of another slide. That'll make sense when we get to it. Um, but I think it's really important when we talk about Tendai to recognize that not only is it a traditional school, but 1,200 years ago, it was a really rather innovative school. <clears throat> so what was in Japan when Tendai before Tendai came along. The first is that Shinto was present when bent Buddhism was introduced. Kami no Michi, Shinto, was a loosely observed set of animist and polytheistic rituals, traditions, and beliefs that was practiced by the people in the Japanese archipelago by the Yayoi people, which would have been about 300 BCE to about 300 CE, approximately when Buddhism arrived. And when I say arrived, while we'll talk about it in a few moments when it officially came to Japan, Buddhism had been sort of um, dispersed to Japan from Korea and from China um, by people who were visiting the archipelago previous to um, the formal introduction. So um, next month, um, I will be discussing the syncretism between Shinto and Buddhism that started almost as soon as Buddhism formally arrived in Japan. That's a, a separate discussion, but it's also of interest. Buddhism in China, India, and Korea were in a, dam a dynamic process of change and growth at the time Buddhism was introduced to Japan. And this was an ongoing project, a pro <laughs> ongoing process. And that is to say that when Buddhism was first introduced to Japan, major influences had yet to develop on the continent. So think of it this way, when Buddhism was first introduced to Japan, Tiantai did not exist as a separate school. 
Bodhidharma was just arriving into China from India. Tiantai was not present. The Sarstavada and Sartranika schools were still the major schools of thought in Buddhism. So at the time Buddhism was being introduced in Japan, people often don't think of it this way. Buddhism in China was really still developing. With the formal advent of Buddhism in Japan, there was also the introduction of writing, Taoism, Confucianism, and Chinese-style government, and the imperial court. And Japan was a collection of fiefdoms that were loosely, loosely unified from around 400 to 900 CE, when with an emperor and empress as sacerdotal sources of political authority and the rulers of the nation. So when Buddhism was being introduced, Japan was a fiefdom that was still developing. Uh, and it was not a, na a nation state the way we think of a nation state today. It was, it was really a much more loose confederation. The introduction of Buddhism to Japan. Buddhism was introduced to Japan unofficially about 467, and all the dates that I'm giving here are CE. Uh, and officially in 552, according to Nihon Shoki, which was the uh, Chronicles of Japan, the second oldest book of classical Japanese history. And Buddhism had most likely been presented by Chinese and Bajike, current Korea, immigrants, merchants, and sailors several centuries before. Um, and the 467 date that we see were a group of Buddhist monks from Gandhara who traveled to Japan with the Buddhist canon and illustrations, preaching and sharing the teachings. Under the Empress Suiko and Chief Minister Prince Shotoku, Japan uh, Buddhism became a formal part of the imperial rule. You may recall, as I mentioned, Empress Suiko, Suiko pre in previous discussions, the role of women in Buddhism she was one of the first Buddhist monarchs in Japan who had taken the vows of a nun shortly before becoming empress. Her nephew, Shotoku, was appointed Sesho, and he was a devoted Buddhist and is alleged to have written the annotated commentaries on the three sutras, the Lotus Sutra, the Vamalakirti Sutra, and Srimala Devi, Srinihata Sutra. This demonstrates that from a very early time, Japan was really incorporating Buddhism into the, into the fabric of the nation. The first of these commentaries is traditionally dated to about 615 and is considered the first Japanese text, which makes Shotoku the first Japanese writer. It is significant that this text was a commentary on the Buddhist sutras. And also to understand how Tendai, excuse me, how Tendai fit into Japan at the time that um, at the beginning of the ninth century, we have to realize that Nara was a center of Buddhist activities and the imperial court from 710 to 794. The montage at the right is from contemporary Nara. There were six schools of Buddhism based on Chinese and Korean philosophical schools. Well, Shravakayana, which we would all refer to today by its modern form, Theravada, and Bodhisattvayana, which we refer to as Mahayana uh, today. The categorization of the Nara schools is a convention of cultural history and of Japanese Buddhology. These schools were not sectarian in the way we think of sectarianism today. And the, the, most of the schools were founded in Japan previous to the Nara period, but were centralized in Nara during the reigns of Empress Genmai and Emperor Kanmu, who moved the capital to what is today Kyoto. The capital of Nara was modeled after Chang'an, the capital city of the Tang Dynasty. The schools that I'm going to list are in order of appearance in Japan and are not necessarily their importance or other criteria, it's just the chronological appearance. And the first is the sun run that asserted the self and the world are empty. And this was established around 625 and it was referred to as the 33 Treatise or Middle Way School introduced from Kogdo, current Korea, based on Nagarjuna's writings. 
And this was never really a separate sect. The second school was Jojitsu, denied the permanent reality of the self and the world, and was based on the Indian Sotranitika, which was in turn based upon the Sarstavadins. Their name literally means those who rely upon the sutras. As such, they did not accept the Abhidharma, and there was never a separate school. It was actually considered part. This was actually considered part of the Sunrun school. Hoso asserted the nature of reality as a function of the mind and introduced to Japan around 653. Hoso was a school based upon the teachings of Azabandhu and Asanga, fourth century founders of Yogacara and the conscious only or mind only school. And this school was brought to Japan by a Japanese priest, Dosho, who had gone to China and returned. It still functions as a very small denomination today. Kusha denied the permanent reality of the self, but not the world, and introduced to Japan around 658. It is also based upon Vasubandhu's writings. It was an Indian Sarstavada school and is considered a subdivision of the Hoso school. Interestingly enough, the monks who may have brought it to Japan are unknown, and it died out in both China and Japan. Kegon linked all existences into the web of interpenetration introduced in 736 from the Chinese and Indian monks. It is essentially the same school as Huahian in China. The main temple is the famous Tendaiji, which you see a, uh, an example of uh, in the middle on the right of that large building. Uh, the precept platform uh, for Vinaya vows was built at Todaiji Temple in front of the hall housing the great Buddha, Daibutsu. Kegon was also responsible for creating the Kokobunji in various provinces in Japan. A special interest is that the well-known monk Miyoe incorporated both Zen and Shingon practices in the, into Kegon in the 12th century. And the final school that I'll talk about is the Ritsu, which taught the precepts governing the dis discipline of monks and nuns. The name is a transliteration of the Vinaya introduced to Japan in 754 by the Chinese monk Ganjin and the Dharmagupta version, the Theravadan version of the Vinaya. And so this is, these are the six schools and these schools really functioned as state Buddhism uh, taken together, not as separate schools that were in some way competing with, uh, with each other or otherwise um, uh, involved in that sort of thing. They, they were all competing for the favor of the emperor, but not in terms of what their philosophies may have been. And the reason I mentioned the philosophies is that you can see through this how you have both the, the Theravada, at that, of which I'm referring to as Shravakayana, and the Mahayana, the Bodhisattva Yana, that were present in all the schools in Japan at the time that Tendai had been introduced. And it's important to keep in mind that these schools were staffed largely by monks, nuns, and artisans from Korea and China. Japanese monks and nuns were ordained under these continental teachers. The imperial cult prohibited clergy from practicing and propagating Buddhism in the countryside and thus restricted them to their home monasteries in other words, as a state religion, these schools were not permitted to actually teach uh, in the countryside. They could do things like funerals and memorial services. The government also limited the annual number of monks receiving ordination, which could only be carried out at an officially sanctioned ordination platform, such as Todaiji, which you see in the picture here. The court conferred rank on leading monks, thus creating a sense of gratitude and obligation as well as a chain of command used to regulate the clerical community. The official system gave rise to illegal monks who were often self-ordained and worked freely among the people. Following the Nara era was the Heian era <clears throat> from 794, that should be 1118, not 118, um, corresponds to Hienkyo, the new imperial capital named after Mount Tie, northeast of Kyoto. Hienkyo was later renamed Kyoto. It's a period in Japanese history when Chinese influences were in decline and the national culture matured. The Heian period is also considered the peak of Japanese imperial court 
and noted for its art, especially poetry and literature. Oops, sorry about that. I meant to hit a couple of things here, but forgot to do it. And so Tendai arose at the beginning of the era and dominated throughout. The so-called new schools of Buddhism, Rinzai and Soto Zen, Jodo and Jodo Shinshu and Nichiren began at the end of this period called the Kamakura era when imperial rule declined and the shogunate or military governance became dominant. And the Bakufu or tent of the shogun was located in Kamakura, southwest of today's Tokyo. This was a period in Japan when Chinese influences were in decline and the national culture developed. More about that as we go on. And these changes were part of the ascendancy of the Tendai school in Japan. And we can't talk about the founding of Tendai and not talk about Saicho, the founder. And we see here the, some of the most important early Zasu or spiritual heads of Tendai, starting with Saicho on the left, going on to Enin, Enshin, Gyogen, and Genshin. We can have a number of others uh, here, but these, these are examples. And of course, Dengyo Daishi or Saicho was lived from 767 to 822. He was a disciple of Gyosho, who was a disciple of Dosen, a renowned monk from China of the Tiantai school, who, had, who was brought from East Mountain teaching of Chan Buddhism and the Chan of Bodhidharma, Huayan teachings and the Bodhisattva precepts to Japan. He took Tonsure at 14 years of age and full monastic precepts at Todaiji when he was 20 years old. Emperor Kamu granted a petition for Saicho with an interpreter, Gishin, to travel to Japan in order to receive teachings in Tiantai meditation and esoteric practices. And he did so in 804, 805. And upon his return, he established a new Tendai school in 805 on Mount Tie. Sometimes it's listed as 804, sometimes 805. I won't get into that now. On Mount Tie, it was provided with two ordinances one to study Mikyo or esoteric practices, and one to study Makashikan or meditation. It also returned with an uh, Oxhead School of Chan, and that was also practiced on Mount Hie, obviously along with the Lotus Sutra. I'm gonna talk about a few features of Tendai. Since we discuss many of these features often, I'll just go through them and if you have a question, write it down and I can expand on it in the question and answer period. I'm not talking so much about any specific sets of philosophies. Um, keep in mind that most of these features that we're gonna discuss had a profound effect on all of Buddhism in Japan, not just on Tendai in the years after Tendai's founding. Most major Japanese Buddhist schools still around today after Tendai was after Tendai were founded by monks from Enrakuji, the head temple of which we are a branch temple, that is to say, uh, Jionzen Tendaiji. And of course, the first feature of Tendai is the Lotus Sutra as a primary canon, Tiantai philosophy, Shikango or Shikan meditation. And this was an innovation uh, into. Uh, Japan had, had not been in Japan before. The Lotus Sutra was here. Some ten, Tiantai philosophy was here, including from Saicho's teacher, but Shikan meditation was new from this period of time. Taimitsu, or esoteric practice, and Taimitsu in and of itself, which was the um, using the exoteric and the esoteric together, was really an innovation in Japan also. The idea of Hongoku, inherent awakening, was uh, an innovation from Tendai. Pure land practices, specifically the Rungishin, were an innovation. The establishment of the Bodhisattva vows, as opposed to the Vinaya, uh, took, was proposed by Saicho and became the norm in Japan as an innovation. 
Hunji Sui Jaku, which incorporated the kami. Now, this had begun to occur during the Nara period, but it really accelerated during the Heian period. And we find the syncretism between Shinto and Buddhism to take place, especially within Tendai and Shingon schools. That was the head temple for both the imperial court and the shogunate at sometimes at the same time, sometimes at different times. Tendai was considered the mother of many Buddhist schools, as mentioned before. And it spread Buddhism to the provinces in the way that the Kokobunji had not earlier. As a matter of fact, there was a during the time of Gyogen, uh, we find that there was really a push by Tendai to send Tendai monks to the Kokobunji, the regional temples, in order to propagate Buddhism. And it established schools and construction projects in the provinces. And those are some of the features of Tendai. In conclusion, for many of the people joining us this evening, Tendai may be relatively new or it may be old hat. There are many choices of Buddhism because it, in uh, outside of Japan, there are many choices of Buddhism because the teachings have immigrated to the West from Asia starting in the 19th century. And many people may not have heard of Tendai because there are other schools that are larger in Asia, such as Pure Land Buddhism, or more exotic, such as Tibetan Buddhism, or had a specific introduction by a charismatic leader at the right time, such as D.T. Suzuki, Suzuki Shunru, Maizumi Roshi, for those attracted to Zen, or there may be adherences to some of the so-called new, new religions, such as Soka Kakai or Rishikosakai. Even today in Japan, Tendai is perhaps the fourth or fifth largest school by number of members. It has approximately 3,500 temples and a similar number of sordio. That said, it still has an outsized influence on Buddhism in Japan. It is an Ekayana school, complete or round teaching, and is not a one practice school such as those that follow pure land or chanting practice, etc. Tendai is relatively new outside of Japan. It's my feeling that because of the many teachings that it offers and its flexibility, it may be a good match for those seeking a traditional form of Buddhism in the modern world. I know that some people are not fond of history and recounting origins as traditional schools of Buddhism, and this may seem tiresome, but it's a, both a show of gratitude to our founders and a desire to better understand this particular form of Buddhism in context that I presented the anniversary of Tendai this evening. And I thank you for your attention. And some of the sources that I use are listed here. And for those people who really want to dig deep into what the Heian period was like, I suggest Adolfson's The Gates of Power, Monks, Courtiers, and Warriors in Pre-Modern Japan. If you really need something to go to sleep by, I suggest Saicho, the establishment of Japanese Tendai School. Um, Paul Groner would agree with me, by the way, on that. And if you want something more exciting, you can read John Stevens' The Marathon Monks of Mount Hie. And we will have questions, comments, and thoughts. And so for this, I will unmute everyone. You're welcome to unmute now. And I'm going to, okay. Now, do we have any, any questions to begin with? <laughs> Any questions, right? <laughs> Any questions? Aaron has a question. Aaron, please go ahead. So I had a quick question. I know there's different lineages in Tendai. I yes. know there's a temple and a mountain. What difference is it? Does it play? And like, what exactly are we? Um, okay. Well, there's actually two, um, I think two points in there that I should make. And then Ichishima Sensei might like to make a comment about that. I think you're talking about um, the mountain Tendai and the base of the mountain Tendai. Onjoji is the term uh, for, the for those on the base of the mountain. And there was a split early in, in Tendai uh, history among the, the second and third Zasu, as a matter of fact. And that's when they split into an upper mountain and lower mountain contingent. 
since then, they had reunited going back um, over a thousand years ago. They had reun or about a thousand years ago, they had reunited. Um, so they're together. Then within Tendai, there are several lineages, and we're of the Homon lineage specifically. Itshishima Sensei, would you like to address that a little bit further? Well, uh, Japanese Tendai. Uh, divided into uh, three uh, denominations later. Uh, as uh, Moishin mentioned, that uh, Mount Hie is uh, Sammon. We call it the mountain gate, and literally speaking. That is uh, Mount Hie itself. And uh, uh, the ancient, uh, I think, uh, first uh, predecessor, uh, he separated from Sammon to Jimon. Uh, G, Jimon, literally speaking, G is Terra, uh, what should I say, temple, temple gate. So at the uh, ancient case, he's uh, emphasizing more esoteric way uh, of thinking, I think. Uh, but anyway, uh, ancient also uh, spent uh, uh, more than six years in China to, um, in, uh, to introduce more about esoteric as many esoteric side of Buddhism uh, to Japan, because you know the Shingon sect, uh, as you know, the founder uh, was Kukai, uh, who brought uh, essentially the esoteric Buddhism to Japan. Uh, while the Saicho introduced uh, uh, total, what should I say, more uh, comprehensive studies of Buddhism. Uh, you know, Tendai also, you know, and many, especially uh, his main purpose to visit China was to take the Tendai uh, Buddhism to Japan by the uh, order of uh, Kanmu Tenno Emperor. And he returned to Japan. Uh, but the whereas uh, uh, Kukai also went to China all the same period of time, but he had to stay in China more than 20 years because he was just a student, you know, uh, to study more about Buddhism. Whereas uh, Saicho was essentially the uh, kind of visiting professor, uh, like uh, dispatched by emperor to uh, take a lineage of Tentai, more authentic uh, Tentai uh, teachings from China to Japan because Kamu, uh, rather uh, uh, afraid or uh, hate that uh, uh, Nara period Buddhism because they dominated most part of the religion sect to Japan and the influential too much, you know, if, uh, advice to government. So Kamu hated that way of, uh, what shall I say, <coughs> uh, politics. And so he moved uh, uh, the main uh, place from Nara to uh, Kyoto uh, later. And uh, he, uh, but he need uh, further spiritual, what shall I support from uh, uh, Saicho because Saicho was very, uh, of course he studied and he got the lineage of everything, especially uh, Ganjin who brought the uh, uh, the uh, official uh, Ritsu, Pinaya tradition. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, he, Saicho thought maybe uh, Japan need to have more broader, like a uh, uh, Mahayana type of Buddhism, Bodhisattva, to help all people. Uh, you know, whereas uh, Nara Buddhism, they just uh, maintain the, uh, what shall I say? Uh, uh, Pratyeka Buddha or uh, such, you know, uh, Shurabaka styles of Hinayana way. But uh, he wanted to establish Mahayana uh, platform center at Mount Hie. And uh, so uh, Tendai was established uh, around, yeah, yes, as uh, Monshin mentioned, uh, January 26th. Uh, <coughs> 806, that was the uh, first uh, uh, time to establish the Tendai, uh, uh, Tendai Buddhism in Japan. 
and later, uh, you know, ending and Enqing went to China. In the case of Enning, he stayed uh, almost 10 years uh, to study more about the esoteric Buddhism because that esoteric part of Buddhism is rather uh, lacking uh, comparing with uh, Shingon uh, tradition. That's why uh, entering stayed there uh, almost uh, ten, 10 years in China. That was very famous story that uh, Edwin Oreishawa, the former, what shall I say, uh, Japanese, uh, 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 um, uh, American, what shall I say, what is? Uh, ambassador. Ambassador. And he studied uh, Enin's diary, and they, uh, that was very important to study that period of uh, uh, China. And so uh, that was his uh, dissertation to Harvard University that was appeared in English, uh, Enin's diary. <laughs> then after Enin, uh, Enqing appeared, he stayed in uh, China only just six years, but uh, his way of thinking is more uh, esoteric uh, type of Buddhism. So uh, such a way, uh, such a way, uh, uh, mountain school, Hiezang and the Onjoji temple, uh, uh, you know, they down of the foot of Mount Hiei, uh, separated. And later Jimon sect, uh, uh, yeah, that, that is Jimon sect. And, uh, uh, Shinsei sect, that is only pure land way of just counting Nembutsu type, that's uh, separated. So anyway, these three are major, I think, uh, changes of Japanese Tendai Buddhism. Uh, just as, as a point to, to, on Aaron's, and then I'll take a couple more questions, but just a point on Aaron's question about the difference between the Sanmon and Jimon uh, sects within um, within Tendai Shu, a number mm -hmm. of years ago, we had a an event at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts um, that was uh, the Jigyodan, the uh, Tendai Charitable Foundation, which is the uh, works with the Betsuin here and Mount Ta uh, very closely, and so we had an anniversary celebration for our. Um, Hondo, the, the renovation of our Hondo. And at that time, this was the second, uh, the second year after the, the, we had the, the, uh, the consecration of the Hondo. And uh, so we went to Boston Museum. And the reason, one of the reasons we chose to do that was that um, William Sturgis Bigelow and uh, Fenelosa, Fenelosa had been a curator and Bigelow had been one of the major contributors to the museum. And that the, Bigelow's collection of materials from Asia was really the corpus of the Asian collection at the Asian, uh, at, at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And so Bigelow and Fenelosa were both Tendai monks and they, trained, uh, they trained in at um, uh, Unjoji. And as a matter of fact, the, the temple they trained at is still there. We, Schumann and I visited the temple. And it's really interesting to see that they retained the, the room that um, Bigelow lived in exactly the way he lived in it. They still have his couch, his desk, his chairs, the, the globe. The, you know, the whole room is just Bigelow's room the way he left it when he left. And by the way, his ashes and, and Fenelosa's ashes are at in Joji. Uh, well, half of the ashes, half are in Boston, half are, are in, uh, in Japan. But the funny part of it was, this was all preliminary. So I mentioned to um, the Jigyodan, I said, well, why don't we, as the celebration for our second anniversary, why don't we go to, to um, it's, it was also the anniversary of Bigelow's becoming, uh, or the ordination as Tokido. It was that happened to be the 125th anniversary. This was in the 1880s. So the first Tendai monks in America were actually Boston Brahmins <laughs> and, and in the 1880s. And I said, well, why don't we go to Boston Museum and we'll have a celebration of the 125th anniversary of Bigelow? 
And they sat there and, and Yamada sensei and, and uh, um, Okiyama sensei and uh, some others. And they said, well, I don't know. That was an Unjoji. That wasn't <laughs> And one of them said, well, I guess it's okay. That was a long time ago. It's okay. Well, we can do it now. <laughs> so <laughs> when you think about it, they, they keep those things in mind for a long time. <laughs> okay. Sorry to, sorry to be wandering around so much, but there it is. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Say again, did you have your hand up? Yes, sir. So my question is, is there tension between the current traditional nature of Tendai and the pull to be flexible and revolutionary in order to spread the school? What should be our guiding point of view between these uh, two points of view of being traditional or the nature of Tendai, which is very flexible? Thank you. Okay, I can't, I can't speak for Tendai, I can just speak for myself. Okay, so take it from that. And I think that, that when we look at it, Tendai itself, you know, is not only traditional, but when we talk about tradition, it's really very Japanese cultural. At the same time, Tendai, as you'll find out next month, is at the forefront of many changes in Japan, through it is, it has been throughout it, Japanese history. And today, Tendai is still undergoing many changes. It's a dynamic process. It couldn't sit still if it wanted to, because the society itself is changing and Tendai has to change with society. So I don't think it's revolutionary, but I don't think it needs to be revolutionary because it's to say, if we're gonna follow the teachings of someone from 2,500 years ago, what is revolutionary? In other words, it's, it's undergone 2,500 years of development and there must be something there that's, that's part of the wisdom process. And we're not going to change just to change, but at the same time, I think the change occurs when it needs to occur. And so I look at such things as um, 150 years ago, women would not have been permitted on Mount EA, literally, you know, but they've been on Mount EA for many, many other years. You have, you know, nuns who are very famous nuns in Japan now who are at the forefront of women's issues, as an example. Um, you have a situation where uh, Tendaishu, because it's Ekiyana, does not hold to just one set of teachings as being one thing is right for everybody. It recognizes that there are different things that are appropriate for different people. And I, so I think that that speaks to a kind of not modernization, but I think that modernization today actually has a bad name, <laughs> but, but a sense of progressive. Uh, it's progressive in its very nature. As you'll hear Job speak next month, he's going to be doing a discussion on um, Hagami Sensei, who was seminal in developing interfaith tradition in Japan starting in the, in the 1980s, uh, long before any other schools of uh, Buddhism in Japan were, were really interested in that sort of thing, specifically joining forces with other religions for the purposes of world peace and, and those lofty sorts of goals. So I hope that, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, maybe, one, maybe one more quick question, if anyone has a quick question. Shoshi, go ahead. Yeah, it, it strikes me as ironic, and you, you were talking very early on about the inclusivity of all of the various schools and so forth. And I'm just wondering um, what's happened. Uh, the sanghas um, today don't seem to be um, very interactive. I mean, I'm thinking of the United States. Yeah. Um, you, you, you know, we have trouble getting together with our neighbors, neighbors up the street and so on. So I just wondered if you could just comment on that. I, th I think what you're looking at is a, an American phenomenon, a sectarianism that spread in America. 
Um, in Japan, they get along to, to a much better extent. <laughs> I'll put it that way. But also in Japan, you have the Ministry of Religious Affairs. And so they make sure that everybody plays nice. <laughs> in this country, I think, look at the difference within Christianity, for instance, between evangelical right-wing groups versus some of the uh, less right-wing evangelical Christian groups in America. I mean, I think that's just part of, of American culture. I think that it's reflecting that more than anything yeah. in, in Buddhism. And, and the other thing is, in Buddhism, you have in America, not to say you don't have Tibetan Buddhists and you don't have other Buddhists in Japan, but people really align themselves in those ways in a sectarian fashion um, that is very peculiar to um, Western ways of doing things, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, Ralph, you have, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted, was wondering if you'd uh, 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 touch on the, uh, the, the, the Nickerin uh, uh, branch of... of uh, uh, no, did you know? The Nichiren branch, did you say, Ralph? Yes. Okay. Um, well, Nichiren Buddhism was at its outset. Um, Nichiren himself, the, the founder of Nichiren Buddhism, of course, follows um, the Lotus Sutra very closely, and it's based upon the mantra Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, as being the, which is the exalted title of the Lotus Sutra as being the one thing that one needs to do to that in faith and Nichiren, the person, um, at, to attain awakening. But then we would get involved in the whole issue of Mapo, the period of the degenerate Dharma, and whether or not the, the teachings would be available outside of, of through, the ben, through the benefit of, of tidi, um, Tadiki, which is the Tadiki, the, the the faith in the other, which we also find in Pure Land. So now we're getting into a whole branch of, of discussion. Um, but Nichiren was himself a very volatile and uh, divisive individual at the time of his lifetime. And he was exiled twice, <laughs> not by Tendai, but by the religious administration of Japan because he was um, so divisive and... Uh, tried to say that any other school of Buddhism other than Nichiren was uh, illegitimate. And so that's, that's not to speak to, to, to uh, Nichiren Buddhism today, but that was, that was part of its founding. Okay? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna move along, otherwise we're gonna be very late. So I thank everyone for your attention. I hope that for those people who've seen this and heard this many, many times before, that you found at least a, a sliver of something interesting that you hadn't seen before. And uh, for the people who have been coming and they wonder, well, what is Tendai other than what I might have read in a book or a footnote someplace, this might give you a better understanding of how, how Tendai fits within the larger picture. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. And so I'm going to move us along at this point. This evening, we discussed the establishment of Tendai Buddhism in Japan. An aspect of this story which we did not explore is the extent to which Mount Hiei, in Japanese, Hiezan, is a major character in the narrative. Hiezan is the home of Enrakuji temple with its dozens of associated temples and Shinto shrines, training facilities, residences for clerics and lay people, as well as administration buildings and even a ryokan, formal Japanese inn for travelers. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and an intentional wilderness area. And when I say wilderness, I'm not exaggerating. As Shakyamuni Buddha taught, everything in the cosmos has Buddha nature. On Hiezan, religion, the natural environment, including much wildlife, culture, and human beings are all integrated into an indivisible unity. Some other evening, I should give a presentation on Hiezan as distinct element of Tendai Buddhism. Let me relate that essential to understanding about Tendai 
is to understand the deep integration of the natural world with the teachings and practices. It is important to recognize that what Hiezan means not just to Tendai, but to the Japanese people. Tendai did not impose its religious views on people, but assimilated positive values of love of the land and the mountain worship from the people. It is not just a, a monastery separate from the world and daily life below, but an integral part of people's own religious and cultural heritage. We, people outside of Japan, can relate to the universal values of integration of nature, religion, culture, and our daily lives. One need not be Japanese to appreciate that. Though we, people living in the postmodern societies, are often divorced from such an integrated perspective by our disparate lives. But you know what? We can change that. We, humans, and other sentient beings, if we are to survive the climate disaster we are experiencing, we must change that. The good news is that the same thing that we need to do in a self-sustained environment, a harmonious society, a world that our grandchildren's children will want to live in, are the same things we need to do to realize awakening. We must seek a oneness with nature, not merely by living in a beautiful place, but by doing all those things in harmony with nature that are modeled for us on Hiezan to this day. One does not need to be a male or female monk, a priest. It is enough to be a sincere Tendai practitioner. This is not just an affiliation, a member of the club, though being a Tendai Sangha member is important. It means living a life that is dedicated to the bodhisattva path, integrated with nature, doing those things to preserve our mother, the earth, and living our tradition in our daily lives. There will be more about this aspect of the practice coming up very soon, as a matter of fact, next month. The point to remember for today is that Hiezan has nourished the spirits of Tendai since Saicho first walked onto the mountain. And the mountain undefiled will continue to be a place of beauty, natural harmony, and sustenance. Hiezan itself is the heart of Tendai. Svaha. And I will move us along. But first, <clears throat> from Saicho, what is the treasure of a nation? A person with a mind set on the way. One with such a mind is a true treasure. The ancients have said that the nation's wealth does not consist of a peat of a heap of precious stones. One virtuous individual who illumines a thousand leagues is a national treasure. The old philosopher stated clearly, one who speaks but does not act is the teacher of a nation. One who acts but does not speak is the foundation of a nation. One who both speaks and acts is the treasure of a nation. That is from Sideshow. <clears throat> 